So announcements are just reminders from last lecture that our exam review is going to be this Sunday afternoon, 2 to 4 p.m. in Math 100. And the exam is going to be Tuesday, 7 to 9 in Chem 140. Um, so for the exam review, like always, I'm not going to have any stuff prepped. I'll just print out some old exams. And then if you guys come with questions or stuff that you want to go over, then we can totally go, through, go over that. Um, and then the exam is going to cover up through the end of Chapter 22. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of where we're on track to end up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions about that? Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping to finish up Chapter 22 by Friday, and so then on Monday, um, haven't decided yet. Maybe just more synthesis practice, but yeah, we'll see how we go. So I might, I guess, maybe if I finish all the new reactions from chapter 22 but don't quite get to the synthesis practice yet we can do that on Monday and then it's not really new stuff so yeah okay all right so where we're in the middle of right now um, this chapter is all about stuff you can do at the alpha carbon one away from the carbonyl and so um, we've looked at exchanging protons there we've looked at halogenating there and then last lecture we started getting into the aldol reaction which is important enough that we're spending some of today on it, too. Okay. So Aldol reaction continued. Um, so we looked at equilibrium reactions um, for the Aldol. So um, In aqueous acid or base, we saw that you don't really have a ton of control over which molecule plays which role. So if you're trying to do a crossed aldol, like two different molecules reacting together, unless you're real clever about how you set it up, um, you're not going to be able to pick what product out of up to four possible products um, you get. Okay, so we started looking at um, ways to work around that, and the biggest way to do it is with LDA. So so LDA, its whole deal is you can choose one molecule to make the enolate, um, Actually, I'll draw separate steps on this just so we can review what exactly is going on here. So you use LDA. It deprotonates only the molecule we want it to deprotonate. You make only the enolate that you want. And then you bring in only the thing that you want it to attack. So say this guy. And then the only possible outcome is this one attacking this one, not any of the other way around, not any of this attacking itself, not any of this attacking itself. <laughs> okay, so that's the only product you're going to get, assuming that we don't heat it up and um, make condensation more likely. So. Okay, so LDA is a really good way to get very precise control over what happens when. Um, and so, I guess even though, you know, you might see some reactions where we set up aldol for you using aqueous acid or base, if you're ever in doubt, um, it's pretty hard to go wrong using LDA if you're trying to do this in a synthesis. So if you know one way to do aldol, probably LDA is the better way to go. Okay, so that's kind of a review of the end of last lecture. Um, the one thing I didn't get to cover is the one other concern or thing to be aware of. It's not exactly a problem so long as you know about it and can manage it for LDA. So the one possible concern is if multiple enolates are possible for a given molecule, Okay, 
so um, say we're looking at this guy. It's got 1h over on this side, and it's got 3h's over on that side. Um, I guess I sort of hinted at this in the last lecture that if the, I guess it would have to be a ketone for this to be applicable, but um, if the ketone's asymmetrical, then we may have to worry about which side is actually getting deprotonated. Um, so it turns out LDA being a big bulky base, do you think it's going to have an easier time going for the left side or the right side on this? The left, yep. So LDA, and I'm going to get specific here, I'll explain why in a second, but one equivalent, if we just throw in enough LDA to just rip off the proton that it wants on 100% of these molecules, plus or minus a tiny bit, then what we're going to get is LDA goes in for like the easiest proton to rip off, the most accessible one, and you get this enolate out of it. Or I guess I should say least hindered side if you throw in a full equivalent of LDA just all of the molecule immediately goes to this and then it's just going to kind of sit there until you throw in whatever else like the other carbonyl molecule or whatever. But the way that we can work around this and still use LDA um, to access the chemistry that we want, if we want to go for the other proton, what we're going to do is throw an LDA at slightly less than one equivalent. So a lot of the time people will write it as like about 95% of what you actually need. So you could say like 0.95 equivalents. The exact number doesn't really matter that much. Like close to one, but not quite one is kind of what we're going for there. Because the way this happens is at first you get something that's 95% of the kinetic, uh, well, okay, I'll get into that in a second. You get 95% of this enolate, and you get 5% of starting material. But as these two things sit around together, this thing can eventually go down, rip a proton off this location here, steal that guy's H, and over time, all of it ends up going to form this enolate instead. So, okay, I slipped up and said the word kinetic, but yeah, that's actually exactly what this is about. This is the kinetic enolate. It forms faster, but it's not as stable because we know that alkenes are happier when they have more R groups on it. This is the thermodynamic enolate. So it's a little harder to form. The H isn't quite as easy to get to, but it's the more stable long-term version of this. So pretty much as long as you're knowing exactly how much LDA you're adding to the reaction, you can actually pick exactly which side you're deprotonating this thing on. Uh -huh. Uh, these ones here? Um, probably it would a bunch of the time too. It's just that that doesn't really give any gain in stability. And if it wants to actually like drop down into a more stable long-term kind of arrangement, like this is the only way there. But yeah, these things are like trading H's back and forth all the time like crazy because some of them have protons or some of them still have like a neutral charge and some don't. And so eventually they're all going to make their way to kind of this state. So, okay, good question. Um, so... Pretty much, we can actually choose exactly what side we're doing stuff to on the molecule. Uh-huh. So, so wouldn't only 5% convert to a thermodynamic product? Um, at first, yes. But then um, that gives this thing its proton back. And so now, like, 5% of these are sitting around neutral. And then, like, another batch of the original enolate can come deprotonate those. So it's pretty much like a cascade where they're all just swapping H's back and forth. And eventually, they pretty much all get to this form. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So pretty much like the molecules don't really know 
like any particular goal that they have in mind. It's just they're going to just randomly do proton exchanges until all of them happen to fall into sort of what's the lowest point on the energy diagram for them. OK. Um, any other questions about that? OK, awesome. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So um, pretty much using LDA, we can choose which side we deprotonate on. Um, I guess I didn't explicitly address this when we were looking at the aqueous stuff earlier. But um, actually, I'll just draw it up here in a box. But in aqueous conditions, we're just going to make the thermodynamic all the time. OK, so I guess you could actually see this as kind of like the difference between like Zaitsev and anti-Zaitsev style elimination when we were doing E2. Like pretty much the only way to get the anti zeitsev product, the kinetic product here, is to use a big bulky base. Like everything else is going to favor the Zaitsev style product or the thermodynamic enolate. OK. Um, OK, that's all I wanted to say about that. <laughs> um, OK, so. I didn't include an example of how you might use this in a synthesis, but let me just throw one up here real quick now. So if we're trying to make, um, I don't know, this thing into this thing, um, we're trying to attach this group over here onto the more substituted side. So this looks like making the thermodynamic enolate, the more sterically hindered or the more substituted enolate. We're adding to the more substituted side. We got to make the thermodynamic enolate. which means probably LDA at 95, or, uh, 0.95 equivalents is going to do the trick. So so make the enolate. And then working backwards, this thing has just the one carbon with an OH on it. So we can actually do that with formaldehyde here. So that kicks down, that goes and attacks formaldehyde. And we end up with technically this at first, which then if we protonate that, stick an H on it and we're done. Oh, one thing that a couple of people have asked me about in the last couple of days that I didn't catch when I was setting up the sapling problems for the last couple of chapters is um, the word protonolysis. Um, I realize that I don't think I've ever used that word in lecture, but protonolysis just means aqueous acidic workup. Um, I think most people figured that out from context or from looking it up. But um, just so it's on the record, that's kind of what that word means. OK, um, so any questions about how I'm sort of breaking this down or working backwards? Yeah? Um, the first the up there, it says an aqueous and thermodynamic is formed. Uh -huh. it, like, so is there no acid base in there? Is it just water or what um, the wording? Mm, oh, um, yeah, so aqueous acid or base. So basically like non-LDA. Yep. <laughs> okay. So yeah, because we're going for the thermodynamic enolate on this problem, um, you could actually just set this up, um, I guess, save a little money on reagents. And yeah, let me actually go through that example too. 
Um, probably go with aqueous base just because we don't want the condensation to happen. Okay, so because we're going for the thermodynamic enolate, we could just as easily have set this up in base. So H2O, NaOH. Note that I am not writing heat on the arrow here because I don't want it to make the alkene, but that would also work totally fine too because fortunately I have the thermodynamic product that I'm looking to form. And also, do I have to worry about um, any large amounts of unwanted byproducts forming here, or the wrong products forming? Yep, yeah, I see a couple of people shaking their heads. Correct, I do not have to worry about um, the wrong aldol products forming because this thing can only get attacked. It can't make the enolate and go attack anything. And this thing, is great at making the enolate and it's not very likely to get attacked. It's a ketone. It's nowhere near as attackable as this aldehyde here, especially since this is like a double aldehyde or formaldehyde. So this is way better at attacking. This is way better at getting attacked. Probably that's going to be by far your major product. You might get like a tiny bit where this goes after another copy of itself, but um, not very much and not very likely. So, okay. Other questions about that? Yeah, so I guess in this case, you can sort of do it either way, but um, that won't always be the case. Like, if in doubt, probably stick with LDA, and then you can just fine-tune whether you want one equivalent or most of an equivalent. Okay. So that about wraps it up for aldol specifically. Um, as kind of a refresher, or as kind of just a summary there, um, aldol specifically applies to when you're doing it with aldehydes and ketones. So the next section that we're going to look at is almost the same reaction, only on esters. But because it's on esters, that actually ends up changing some of the outcome. Okay. So the next one we're going to look at is, or the next ones we're going to look at, are Claisen and Dieckmann condensation. So I guess the difference between these two and aldol is kind of like the difference between like the chapter 21 chemistry that we did where like you have say a Grignard attacking an ester and it boots out a leaving group afterwards versus when we did Grignards on carbonyls like ketones where it just attacks once and you're done. Um, so the difference is now you can kick out a leaving group. Okay. So let's just do one example and then we can talk about some details and why they work out the way they do. Okay. So I'm going to use this ester, for example. Um, and I'm going to use a base to deprotonate that. Um, here's where things get a little bit more complicated. If I used OH minus, that would still deprotonate it OK. But what other reaction might I now have to worry about, given what we saw last chapter? Yep, yeah, it might go in, attack the carbonyl, and then kick up, kick down, get rid of the ETOH. Um, you would end up with a carboxylic acid, which means that you would run out of base pretty quickly. So instead of using this as kind of a general rule, anytime I'm doing stuff with esters here, if I don't want to mess up the ester side of things, I'm going to have to use a base that looks the same as this ester chunk of the material. So I'm always going to use... Like if I've got a bunch of ethyl esters floating around, I'm going to use ethoxide. If I have methyl esters, I'm going to use methoxide. 
So those should be the same to avoid any funny business with the ester getting changed. Um, I mean, this could still totally go attack the carbonyl and kick out the old ETO, but you wouldn't be able to tell that it happened, so nothing would change. Okay, so I want this side of the material and the base to be the same. Um, so now I can make the enolate, same as I did before. And I don't even have to worry about deprotonating like the left side versus the right side or kinetic versus thermodynamic because I really only have one side to deprotonate on esters, which is nice and convenient. Okay, so I do that. I make the enolate. Let's do this on two copies of the same molecule for now, and then we can look at complicating things later on. Okay, so there's another copy floating around minding its own business when this enolate comes in. there. And I have an O minus, just like if I were doing aldol, um, the carbonyl kicks up. But I also have that OET still hanging off of there. So this is the big difference between aldol and clazin is that kicks down, boots out the OET, and that gets me to Here. Okay. So all of this so far is pretty much the same as aldol, just there's a slight twist here where we boot out the leaving group. But it turns out that that being able to reform the carbonyl actually changes things in another way too. Um, because as it turns out, um, if you are a proton that is alpha to one carbonyl, you're moderately easy to deprotonate. Um, I want to say the pKa, I don't remember the exact number, is probably about 22-ish for an ester. Um, once you're a proton that's alpha to two carbonyls, oh, let me actually write that in. Um, if you're a proton that's alpha or next to two carbonyls, suddenly you're a lot easier to pull off than you were before because um, I want to say it goes down to about 10-ish. Um, and that's because if this proton gets pulled off, you can actually show three different resonance forms for that. So given that we're still in base, um, OET is automatically going to come in, pull that H off, and make an enolate um, that's actually even more stable than the original enolate was because um, I'll just Go down this way. Because you can actually show three resonance forms for this. So you can either put the negative charge on the left carbonyl oxygen or on the carbon. So that's you know pretty much the same two forms that we had for any other enolate, like oxygen versus carbon. But you can also bump it out onto the other carbonyl. So like that. Okay, so that's kind of why that H is a lot easier to pull off now that it's surrounded by two carbonyls on either side. And note that this is different from when we did aldol, because here, if I guess we don't have an H in the middle on this example, but if we did still have an H here, like it's not getting any additional boost from having the OH nearby. There's no resonance you can do to help stabilize a negative charge here. Um, having two carbonyls is kind of a game changer, though. Okay, so it turns out when you're doing this reaction, you can't really stop this from happening. Like you make the product kind of equivalent or kind of analogously to aldol, and then it's just going to deprotonate 
regardless of your wishes. So to finish this one up, you actually have to do an aqueous acidic workup, H3O+, and that sticks the proton back on. Okay, so eventually you get to like the product that you briefly formed in the first place. So it's sort of like you make the product, you overshoot it a little by deprotonating it once in the middle, and then once you add acid, it goes back to where you were probably aiming for. Okay, so questions about the, yeah. Well, would you consider the hydrogen sperm as a carbanion in nature or molecule together because they're much more stable? Um, so it's a minor form, but the annoying thing is a lot of people still draw them that way because like any attacks the molecule do does are likely to come from that carbon. So like in sapling, they ask you to show it with the minus charge on carbon. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So there is one really weird and interesting thing about this. And that is that even though like so far I'm kind of discussing this like extra deprotonation step as like a minor annoyance that happens, um, turns out this is actually crucial for the success of the reaction. Okay, so if we try setting this up with a molecule that doesn't actually have another H in the middle there to pull off, um, we're actually not going to get any product, weirdly enough. So, um, here we go. I'm sort of jumping around a little bit in the notes by covering it in this order a bit. Okay, so if we do. This molecule where it's just got the one H in the middle. So we pull off an H, the only H, we make the enol H. Um, and in theory, we should be getting in theory, we should be getting this thing. But the problem is Here we don't have an H that's alpha to two carbonyls. Um, turns out that equilibrium is actually not on our side for this reaction. Um, you can form like a little bit of it temporarily, but it's immediately going to fall back apart, kind of like the retroaldol that um, I mentioned briefly yesterday. Like this thing just, even if it makes this real fast, is not going to really want to stay there. And so this thing doesn't actually work. Um, if I gave you like this setup for a reaction, um, your easiest way to answer how this is going to turn out is actually just writing no reaction. Um, so The product of Claisen is actually disfavored by equilibrium. But the deprotonated version here is favored um, just because you're deprotonating a base with a much lower pKa. And that's kind of the lowest energy point for the reaction. So even though I drew it as like, or talked about it as something that just sort of happens like coincidentally, um, turns out that if you can't do this step where you're sort of like locking in the product by ripping an extra proton off and stopping it from ever reverting, then the reaction is just not going to go at all. So we sort of trap the product there by ripping the extra H off at the end. And then when we add acid, it gets the proton back. But by then, we don't have any base left around. And it's too late for it to go back to the starting material. 
So long story short, you need at least two alpha H's on the starting material for this to work. All right, so if we do this with um, this molecule, like I showed up there, it's got two alpha H's. So this one, the equilibrium does favor where we're going. Um, let me actually do this as like an overall reaction kind of styling. Okay. So overall, we would write NaOET. And since we're using an alkoxide base, um, we're probably just going to use the same solvent that is the conjugate acid of the base, so HOET. Um, and then an aqueous acid workup. will get us the product just fine. Um, or if we had three alpha H's, like if this was just like a methyl group out here with HHH on it, that would also work great. But if only one H is out here, then it's going to be no reaction. Okay. So questions about that? Okay, cool. Um, so this reaction that I put up so far, I guess I haven't distinguished between like the two Claisen and Dieckmann reactions. This one here where it's just two separate ester molecules is Claisen. Um, Dieckmann is exactly the same thing, only the two esters are part of the same molecule. I'm not sure why Dieckmann got to put his name on this reaction that is really just a slight variation on Clay's and stuff, but it's the same thing. <laughs> um, so the big deal here is because they're both on the same molecule, once you react those two ester groups together, it's obviously going to make a ring. OK, so let me move the camera. So, so like this thing, if we hit this with OET minus, um, doesn't matter which side you deprotonate because they're both symmetrical here. So maybe let's just go for this one because it's closer to where I drew the base. Okay. Oh, also as a side note, um, I guess you may be looking at this thing and thinking, hold on, I've got an O minus. I've also got a leaving group here. Um, let me actually draw this out over here just so it's not just me talking. But this might be a question that you're asking. Um, if I'm making an ester enolate, why doesn't it just kick down and boot out the leaving group like we've seen a ton of in the last chapter and make something that looks like this? Um, turns out you 
can make this some of the time. Um, this is actually called a ketene. Um, or you could redraw it as this, or like draw out the carbon explicitly. So this is actually real similar to those cumulated dienes that we covered way back. Um, and it's not as great for the same reasons that cumulated dienes are, like there's no resonance stabilization between these two double bonds. Um, it's just not as favorable as doing something else with the enolate instead. But in case you're wondering why I'm not showing that here, um, you can, but it's not as good, so we don't normally worry about it. Okay, so back to where we were. Okay, okay. So, um, so we deprotonate. We make the enolate. We do not kick out the leaving group here. We got to go do something else with the enolate instead. Let's just go attack that other ester group at the far end of the molecule. And like a lot of ring forming reactions, numbering is very helpful here. We know that we're going to form a bond from this carbon here onto the base of the other carbonyl. So I'm just going to number all the atoms that are going to get incorporated into this ring. So carbon one here forms a loop with two, three, four, five, and then six. So I'm making a bond from carbon one to six. So I'm making a six membered ring which is why I picked that particular length of chain. Um, I'm just going to call it one, two, three, four, five, and six. Carbon number one has this entire bit dangling off of it. Um, I didn't number these, but it's got an extra carbon that's not incorporated into the ring. And then this double bond is gone. It's now single, but I have a carbonyl and an OET coming off of there. So like that, because I reformed this ester group as I did the attack. Um, carbons two, three, four, five had nothing. Carbon six has an O minus and an OET. And so I can just finish up the reaction. Kick that down, kick that out. Get a carbonyl going on there and I still have my ester bit dangling off of here. And then, just like always, I'm going to have to deprotonate once more in between the esters if I want to lock in the product. Uh, which carbon number do I have to do that at? Yep, one. Because this one here is the carbon that's adjacent to two carbonyls. So, <laughs> awkward side hanging H there, but um, if I want to lock in the products, let's show that. Um, boot up to that carbonyl. I could show it going either way. This and then H3O plus reverses that step and gets me the final product. OK, so the initial product you get from Diekmann, um, you sort of overshoot it a little bit by deprotonating, and then you just go back uh, a step when you add the proton back on. OK, so exactly the same arrow pushing as clays, and it's just you have to be a little bit more careful about numbering and keeping track of what connects where. OK, um, so questions about that? Ah, good question. Um, yes, yeah, so this kind of ties back to everything that enolates do in this chapter. Um, like, why do you always attack from the carbon and not from the oxygen? Um, it turns out that for most of the reactions that we're seeing, it just turns out to be more favorable to make a bond from carbon to whatever instead of from oxygen to whatever. There are some reactions that we don't cover where it is actually the oxygen that's more favorable to go and do stuff, um, especially stuff with um, silicon on it that we're not really covering. But um, yeah, usually, 
it's pretty safe to assume that when an enolate attacks, it's going from its carbon? So, good question. OK. So uh, we looked at Claisen on two identical ester molecules. We looked at Dikmon, which is on two ester groups in the same molecule. Let's try looking real briefly in the five minutes I have left at crossed Claisens. So just like crossed aldols, we're going to use two different ester molecules. Okay, so we can actually follow the same basic gist that we did for crossed aldols. Um, use one that's better at attacking. So but now that we know what it takes to do a clason, we don't just need a single alpha proton to get a good product going. We actually need two alpha protons to get a product going. So only one can do the attack, which means that by having at least two alpha H's, um, and only one can get attacked easily. Um, this is a little bit harder to set up. You could do it by giving it um, something a little bit more attackable. So um, the two best choices are either formate esters This thing, which is sort of aldehyde-like out on one side, although we still consider it to be an ester because it's also an ester on the other side. So formate esters. Or something that's kind of like a double ester, like not as two separate full ester groups, but something that kind of has two leaving groups on the same carbonyl. Um, which is a carbonate ester. Um, those of you in lab, about half of you used one of these to do the Grignard dyes lab where it's got two different leaving groups on it. Okay, so both of these are good choices for things to get attacked because not only do they have a sizable delta positive, but also they can never get deprotonated at their alpha proton and cause side products that way. So for example, If we take this thing, um, and react it with like this thing, we might get some product where this thing makes an enolate and goes attacks another copy of itself. But the major product is going to be just this. So like if we call this A and this one B, pretty much the f by far the most prevalent thing that's going to happen is A attacks B. OK. So let me just put up one more example here of a clever way that you can narrow down the options for Claisen. So if we do this thing, you might be looking at this and say, uh-oh, I can make the enolate on either side. I could deprotonate here, or I could deprotonate here. But if I deprotonate here, this only has one alpha H. So sure, I could deprotonate. I could go attack either the other molecule or another copy of this molecule. But it's not going to last very long. It's just going to fall right apart. Um, you know, because I can't lock in the product by doing this deprotonate in the middle kind of step. So this thing will also favor just a single product. 
So like that. Yep. Yeah, I was going to mix if there was two alpha H's instead of one. Right? So that would favor the three alpha H's. Uh, on this side, you mean two alpha H's? Um, oh, yeah, if you had three and two, that would be a bad idea because then either one could attack either and you'd yeah, end up with just four different things. Yep. Yeah, so pretty much you want to limit things by making it so that only one molecule can do the attack in a way that is actually like sustainable and will last after it gets locked in. Okay, cool. So that's a good place to end. Um, I'll continue from here next time.